Well, welcome this morning. Um, it's great to be back. I'm glad that you're here. Glad that you're in the in our service, and want to welcome our online audience to the service as well. Um, so, so by show of hands, how many of you that are here are actually glad to be back? Okay, okay, all right, good. Now, now tell the truth. Are you glad to be back because it's church? Or are you glad to be back because you're just tired of being stuck at home? Right? <laughs> okay. That may be kind of a hard question to, to, to be truthful about, and, and, and I get that, um, but, but, but I'm happy that you're here, um, and I'm glad that the many are joining us on, online this morning, so praise the Lord for that. Um, last week, we started a new series called Restart, because as we begin to restart together, there are some uh, elements that, that I believe are necessary if we're going to have a successful restart. And so we're beginning to talk about those various things um, as we restart. Um, because for the past three months, we haven't been able to do this in person. And I understand that during that time period, because of the constraints, I mean, there were some things, let's be honest, that were, that were kind of uh, difficult for various reasons, okay? And um, so, so, so now we get to come back together, and, and it's great. But there were some challenges that we faced. Um, so some of those challenges involved the technology. Um, on, on one hand, I, I'm super glad that we had the ability to still meet, uh, given those circumstances. Think about it. 25 years ago, if this had happened, we would not have had that capacity. And so even though, you know, for, for some people it's frustrating and it's like I don't really enjoy that as much, at least we could do, at least we could do that. And so that, that was a blessing. But let's face it, the feel was different, right? Kind of a different feeling at home. And some of you have told me, yeah, it was a good feeling to be in pajamas and a cup of coffee or whatever. But yeah, it's a different feeling that we, that we face in doing that. And, and of course, the place. You know, we think, well, this, this is where we're supposed to be meeting. And, and we are. But kind of think about how cool God was in this. You know, the, the adversary said, hey, I shut down the churches. And God says, yeah, I turned every home into a church. You know, so God's smarter than, than, than we give him credit for sometimes. And then the rituals that we do, the various things, you know, standing up and sitting down and the meet and greet and all that kind of stuff there. You know, we, we weren't able to do all those things because of that. And still, some of, still right now, some of the um, restrictions keep us from doing some of the things of, uh, that we're doing. And so what we've had to do is we had to develop a worship time that was very simplified, okay, right? I mean, it was a very simple type of, of, of worship that, that we had, um, and a very basic type of worship. But, but here's what I know, and here's what I don't want us to lose sight of. During that time period, God was still God, wasn't he? Wasn't he? God wasn't less good when we couldn't meet than when we could meet. He's still God. God's still great. God's still powerful. God was still on the throne. And don't lose sight of that. And what I think has happened, at least in, in, in my life, and as our staff have been talking about it, is it, it really helped us in some regards to focus in on, on what was really, really important. I'm not saying the other areas didn't have importance, but as far as what was really the core, the center part of what we call worship, sometimes can get blurred with all the peripherals. And sadly, as we come back, sometimes we make the peripherals the focal point. And the focal point is not the fact that we're sitting in a pew and that we get to uh, sing in person. I mean, all that's great, and, and, I, and, and I don't disparage any of that, but the most important parts of worship really have nothing to do with those and it's easy if we're not careful to make worship complicated and very labor intense in which God didn't design worship to be uh, so you know uh, so so con confusing so complicated so so many different components to it he wanted it to be really simple and uh, if nothing else we've uh, got to focus on what's important and that's again that's not a bad thing at all to do that and so what happens to some people during this recent pandemic is, you know, we get, we get distracted. 
And the same thing happened during the time of Christ. People got distracted even though it wasn't a, a pandemic. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning. Uh, if you have your copy of God's Word, I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15. And we're going to look there. As you're turning to Matthew chapter 15, let me give you the um, setting for this chapter as we go into it. The disciples have gotten into a boat and they're crossing the Sea of Galilee to go to the other side. And as they're doing this, Jesus appears and they're like, you know, is he a ghost? Is it Jesus? And of course, you know the story. Peter gets out of the boat and he walks for a little bit on the water and then sinks and, you know, Jesus raises him up. Well, then they get back in the boat and they go to the other side. Well, they land in the city of Gennesaret. And as they are there, this is where the story unfolds. Now, Gennesaret is about 90 miles north of Jerusalem. So it's a fair distance from the city. And as the disciples and Jesus enter into the city, the news of their arrival spreads and the crowds come out because they want to see Jesus and they want to be healed and they want, you know, they want to be part of that miracle ministry of Jesus. And so people are coming out and, uh, to hear Jesus and what he has to say and what he's going to do. So that's the setting of Matthew 15. So we're going to begin in verse 1 and here's how Matthew opens this up. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, okay, so, so we stop here for a second. Matthew throws this in to cue us in on something. As, as he is there to minister to these people, guess who else shows up? Scribes and Pharisees. Now, he, he puts that in there to, to let you notice that they are there for ulterior motives, okay? They came from Jerusalem. In other words, they traveled 90 miles north to be there. Okay? So these are not Jesus groupies. Okay? Okay? That they weren't just following Jesus around to his next gig so they could be part of that. These guys came all this way and they're wanting to try, cause problems. Okay? But wherever they went, they tried to disparage what Jesus is doing. And so the Pharisees are going to now ask a question in the next verse. And they're not asking the question because they really are puzzled by it. They're asking the question because they want to stir up some kind of controversy and trouble. And you know, sometimes people ask questions and, and they're really doing it to, to be unkind. You know, like you see somebody and they're like, wow, have you gained weight? You know, you know, type, type, type things like that, those type of things there, you know. Wow, um, that must have been a gift, that shirt that they gave you. Somebody must have, you know, gag gift, right? You know, those kind of questions. They really don't want the answer to it. And so, so they ask Jesus this question, and here, here's what it says. Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they wash not their hands when they eat bread? So they ask the question, why aren't the disciples washing their hands before they eat? Now, let's put it in the biblical context. And here's what I want you to understand. The, the, the Pharisees are not concerned about hygiene. Okay? It wasn't that they were worried, that, hey, they're going to spread germs. Okay? They weren't facing a COVID virus at that time. Okay? That, that wasn't the concern. The key that you see in the expression here is why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? That kind of cues you in on that. Now, there was the law of God that was given by, to, from God to Moses, the written law. Okay? And that, that's what we have in the, in the scriptures. There was also a section that they claim was from God. It was the spoken or the oral law. And it was not written down anywhere. In fact, what happened was that the religious leaders would then begin to add additional rules to keep you from breaking the written rule. So you had the written rule that God gave you, and then they would create another rule that, so, so in case you wouldn't break the regular rule. Okay, follow? And so this is what Jesus is talking about. And the Pharisees had this, this tradition that before you eat, you would do this 
ceremony of washing your hands, not to clean off the dirt from your hands, but it was supposed to have some kind of spiritual property, some, some way of, you know, you're going to be really honoring God at a whole nother level by doing this. And uh, it was never commanded by God, it's not in scripture, but they expected that you follow that. Because if you didn't, you might accidentally break one of the dietary laws that they they had. And so what they did is they began to add these different traditions from the elders. And what that did is it made religion very complicated because not only did you have to know what the, the rules say in this book, you also had to know what the rules said that weren't in this book. I mean, where are they? Well, they're not written down anywhere. They're just understood. And you know, in churches, there's unwritten rules, right? I mean, every church has some kind of unwritten rule that has it. I mean, it's like, where is it in the Bible? It's not in the Bible, but this is, this is the rule that we have for you to do. And sometimes those rules make sense, and sometimes they, they really don't make any sense. And sometimes they are helpful, and sometimes they're not very, very helpful. Um, the first church that I worked on staff, they had a rule concerning the choir, okay? And here was the rule concerning the choir. If you were in the choir, you could not have a beard, okay? That was the rule, okay? So if you were, you know, Bert would not be allowed in the choir, okay? We don't allow him in the choir anyway, but it's not because of the beard. No, <laughs> no, no. But, but. That was an actual rule that made sense to them. And I'm thinking, wow, that doesn't really make sense. You know, because if you do that, Jesus couldn't even be in your choir, you know. <laughs> and I, I kind of think if you have any rule that, that precludes Jesus, it's probably a pretty bad rule. Okay, but that made sense to them at that time. And so churches have all sorts of these type of rules that, that you can't, you know, you can't find anywhere in the Word of God, but we make up these rules, and sometimes those rules become more important than what this says. And so we say, here's what the Bible says, and here's our rules, okay? And so that's what was happening at Jesus' time as well, is they were elevating their own rules higher than what uh, the law of God was there. So um, it, it just, you know, Jesus didn't buy into it. Jesus knew what they're doing. And Jesus says, listen, I'm not playing that game. I, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with that. And nor should you. So as they ask Jesus that question, Jesus doesn't answer that question. But what he does is he asks them another question that really exposes the, the reason why they even asked that question in the first place. So uh, verse 3, but he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And then if you would skip down to verse 6, he says a whole bunch of stuff, verse 6, thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. The Pharisees here use their their spoken tradition to actually avoid doing one of the written commands of God. And Jesus says, I'm I'm, I'm seeing through that. And, And honestly, here's what happens. A lot of times our unwritten tradition rules are just simply a way to circumvent what God has told us to do because we don't really want to do that. And so if we do this command, it looks like we're spiritual, but we're really not. And here's what happened. Moses in the Ten Commandments, you might remember that, okay? In one of the Ten Commandments, he says that that we are to honor our father and mother, right? That was one of the commandments. When the Bible tells us to honor our father and mother, it's not saying simply that we're just respectful. You know, yes, sir, uh, thank you, um, you know, being kind or whatever. Implicit in that command of honoring our parents is the obligation for children, listen, young people, is the obligation for children to take care of their parents when they become elderly and cannot take care of themselves. The expectation was that when your parents become aged and can't take care of yourself, that the responsibility would fall to children. 
And the Pharisees decided, you know, that was a big drain of their resources. And so they came up with a complicated way of being able to circumvent that, to bypass that so that they could look spiritual, they could look like they were righteous, okay? And at the same time, they didn't have to pay for, for, for mom and dad during their old age. And Jesus is calling them out on it. Jesus said, hey, you're worried about this silly hand-washing stuff uh, for food that doesn't really matter in this case. But here's something that's very clear. Moses said, honor thy father and mother, and you have ignored that by your tradition. You've made it null and void. Mm. One of the other um, Pharisee traditions, you know, would take another commandment and take this and that and, and would bypass it. And so Jesus is confronting all that. Go, if you would, now to verse 7 and 8, and here's what Jesus calls them. Ye hypocrites. <laughs> okay, He didn't mince any words. You, you're, you're pretending to be spiritual and God-fearing and God-honoring, but you're not. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. And honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So God is speaking through Isaiah. And Isaiah records God's words to the people. And he says to the people, your words are right. What you're saying, what's coming out of your mouth is correct, but your heart isn't in it. Do you know that you can say and do things that are right and still not be right with God? Do you know that you can actually be in church and not worship God? Yeah. And that's what Jesus was pointing out of the hypocrisy that was going on. That these people were saying all these spiritual things, but inwardly they were wrong. See, when it comes to worship, It's easy for us to get focus on the externals, isn't it? And miss the internal completely. And that's probably because much of our worship has an external component, doesn't it? I mean, you kind of think about it. We we are here in a physical place, that's external. We're singing, that's external. We're hearing preaching, that's external. You know, there's a lot of externals that are taking place. And there's nothing wrong with those. But sometimes we think we can come through and we can check the boxes of all the externals, right? In church, check. On time, double check, you know. Have my Bible and I got it under my right arm, not my left arm, my right arm. Check, you know. Um, got my church clothes on, check, you know, and we go, go down the list and we think that if we get all those boxes checked off, we're good for God, And yet, we can have, hear me, you can have all those things checked off. But if your heart is far from God, this doesn't mean anything to Him. It means nothing. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across here. It isn't necessarily that the tradition is wrong. It's just that the traditions that we do, they're not the most important thing. They're okay to do, they're good, but they're not the most important thing. And these past few months of what they've done is they've helped us, if you're careful, to focus in on what is essential. Okay? I'm not saying we do away with those things, but something happens when you, don't, you can't do those that you've got to really focus on what really is important. And sometimes we can lose sight on what really is important. And I think God, if nothing else, has taken this time to say to us, wake up, guys. Um, It's time to refocus yourself on what really matters. And all these other things are great if you have them and wonderful and enjoy them and be blessed by them. But if you don't have them, focus in on what's really important. Because, you know, these past few months... We haven't been able to meet in person. You haven't sat in a pew. There was no choir singing. There there, there was no offering plate pass. You didn't have to dress up. And yet, worship was still possible. 
you could still worship. Because God isn't limited by those things. And some people think, well, if I don't have those things, then I can't worship God. Well, you're wrong. You, you haven't read your Bible if that's what you're thinking. God's bigger than all that stuff. God is more important than all that. If you didn't have any of that stuff, you could worship God. And so he's just reminding us, okay, now that you have that stuff back again, be thankful. But don't lose sight of what really is important. It's not the stuff, it's God. So according from Isaiah, what was far from God? Their heart, right? That's what he said. Their lips honor me, but their heart is far from me. Here's the takeaway I want you to get. If you don't get anything else out of the message, this is the, the, the focal point of it. The heart of worship is your heart. That's the important element, is your heart. And you come in here, and, and if your heart isn't seeking God, then all the other stuff is meaningless. On the same token, you can take away the other stuff, and if your heart is seeking God, you can have glorious worship of God. Worship is the primary issue of the heart. It's not a ritual itch issue. It's not that we got to be at a certain place at a certain time doing a certain thing. It's all about God. And don't lose sight of that. Don't, you know, don't say, well, if we don't have this, we can't worship. Nonsense. Be grateful that you have it. But if you don't have it, don't worry about that. How is your heart? What is the condition of your heart? Did you come this morning wanting to seek God? Maybe your heart isn't where it should be, but are you seeking the Lord with your heart? That's what he wants us to do. And that's what wasn't happening with the religious crowd in Jesus' day. Notice what Jesus says down in verse 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus says that there is a type of worship that God considers vain. Oh, it's worship. They're going through the motions. Their mouth may even be saying the right things. But God says, from his perspective, it's empty. He wants no part of it. That's kind of hard because we're thinking, all right, we met here and we kind of do this worship thing and we follow the order of service and so God must be pleased and God says, no, that's not how it works. Is your heart where it should be? Is your heart seeking God? Is your heart near God? Is your heart clean? Our heart condition isn't always obvious. Okay? It's like, well, isn't it obvious that I got a heart for God? No, not really. Now, when, our, when the kids in our nursery volunteers go to the nursery now, we have a little scanning device. And they scan their forehead, and immediately we can tell if they have a temperature or not brings a reading. It says, you know, what, if the temple's nor, temperature's normal or, or high, and we can read that. Okay? When you walk into the auditorium, we don't have one of those for your heart. We don't have a scanner. So, okay, you know, heart's right with God. You know, you know. all right, Ronnie, you know, your heart's good. You come on in. Melba, uh, you know. <laughs> no, okay, right? We, we don't have one of those to, to do that. You can't really tell. And you can't just look at a person and say, okay, they, they look like it. They're wearing the uniform. And, you know, they're here, you know, no. Man looks on the outward appearance. Because that's all we can see. But the Bible says that God looks at the heart. The only person that knows your heart is God and you. I don't know your heart. I mean, it would be really neat, Pastor Nate, if we went, if I if I could have like some heart goggles, you know, and just kind of zoom, oh wow, just zoom zoom right in on that on that person. I don't know. You say, well, can't you just tell by looking? No, 
the Pharisees, if you looked at them, they looked like the most spiritual people on the planet. I mean, they were, they were dripping with spirituality. I mean, you looked at them and they were like, wow, this guy is so spiritual. Listen to their long prayers and look at how they're dressed and, and, and everything that they do. And yet Jesus, Jesus said, I looked at them and I called them a whited tomb. You know, he just called them hypocrites. Why? Because Jesus saw what, was, what God sees. And that's what's important is the heart. The heart. Jesus then explains what he just said to the crowd and he takes the disciples away and he explains a little bit more to them about it. And he lets them know that when it comes to worship, a clean heart is more important than washed hands. Okay, Unless you're fighting the coronavirus. Okay, Then wash your hands. But that's not what they were doing. So, what do, we, what do we do with that? How, how do we respond to that? How, how, how do we go with that? Well, go down to verse 18. Here's what Jesus says. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defile not a man. Jesus, listen, if you don't ceremonially wash your hands, God isn't offended. May I say, if you don't observe all the unwritten rules... That doesn't mean God's offended at what you do or what you didn't do. Okay, That's the point that he's trying to get across. But if you have a heart and your heart is filled with these unrighteousness, your heart's filled with evil thoughts and hatred and lust and lies, that offends God. That really does offend God. And you can come in with the washed hands, and you can come in with the holiest of attire, and you can come in with the godliness um, attitude, you know, appearance or whatever. But if your heart is filled with all that corruption, God's offended. God's not impressed. Worship isn't taking place. It's that vain worship that Jesus is talking about. At the heart of worship is your heart. When you come to worship, when you come to church, number one, most important thing that you do is have a heart that wants to seek God. That's the most important thing. More important than all the other stuff that we do. You know, we scramble for all this other stuff. And I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that those things don't have a place. Okay, I didn't say they didn't have a place. I'm just saying they're not the most important thing. And sometimes if you're like me, if you're like the person next to you, they become more of a priority than getting your heart right with God. If you wonder why you go to a service and you don't get anything out of it, it's probably your heart. I know that we don't like to hear that, but it's true. It's our heart. See, the outward appearance is not a reliable indicator. So how's your heart? Is your heart clean? Do you seek the Lord? Now, it's wonderful that we're back together again. I'm excited about that. I'm glad. I love preaching to, to you guys that are here more than just the camera. Okay? Because that's, that's hard. You preach to the camera and i got to imagine your faces. Yeah, and that's a hard thing sometimes, you know. I have to imagine your, your reaction, you know. Those of you that are really encouraging and you smile and you nod. And then those of you that are just like this the whole time. And I'm like... Uh, you know, you know who you are. 
<laughs> Don't make the externals the most important part of worship. What we need to do is every time you come to church, you need to do a heart check, a heart scan. And there's a lot of things I could say. We were talking about as a staff different things that are indicators of the heart. And we kind of came up with a long list. And I said, yeah, they're, 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 you know, that's just too many things to overwhelm them. And so we narrowed it down. These are the three ones I think that as a church, as our church, these are the three big ones I think for us that we need to do. Heart check. Before you go to worship, ask yourself this. First of all, are you compassionate or condemning? What's the condition of your heart? Are you are a person of great compassion, or you just you you, you want to judge everything? All right. Well, certain things should be yeah. I think certain things should be judged or whatever. But but are you a compassionate person? Because I don't know about you. When I mess up, I, I want forgiveness. Don't you? When I'm misunderstood, I want people people not to to prejudge me. Compassion. There was nobody more compassionate than Jesus, was there? And as we come, are we compassionate for God? Here's the second thing. Are you teachable or are you unmovable? When you come, can you, can you actually be taught something? Or do you know all the answers? Some people come to church and I know everything. You can't really teach me anything because I already know everything. Now... Sometimes when, when something comes that's different, it's sort of like the, one of the diagnostic questions when we were doing kind of a, a witnessing technique. If you might remember, one of the questions was, if what you believe was wrong, would you want to know it? And of course, yeah, I'd like to know it, but yet the reality is most of us really don't want to know it. Teachable. Okay. Now, teachable doesn't mean that you automatically just embrace it. Sometimes... Uh, when we're faced with something that's contrary, we're defensive, right? Like last week, I told you, you know, about the sermon that Bert wrote and I preached, okay? Uh, we were kind of sitting in the back, and we were talking about music, and, and I think Gary was saying, well, what kind of music do you want? And, and Bert was really passionate. Well, I just think we only want to play this kind of music. That's all. And then he taught his lesson, and God kind of slapped him around a little bit, and, and, and Bert was teachable by God, can you imagine that? A teacher that God can teach? I mean, that's, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, and, and so we need to be teachable. That is, if we're not where we should be, we need to be willing to let God change us in that. And here's the last one. Are you selfless or selfish? When you come to church, is it all about you or is it about God and others? And sometimes we make church and it's all about me. Me, me, not you, me. And that's a heart, it's a heart condition. It shouldn't be about me. It was me, my family, my wants, my time, my this. No, it should be about God. It should be about others. Sit at the end of the table. Let God have his way. What this tells me as we go through all these is very simply this. We need the gospel every day. The gospel is not just something you needed to get saved and now you got your ticket punched and you're in a way. The gospel is something you need every single day. We need Jesus every day, don't we? Every day. Every moment. And this morning, if you're here or if you're watching and you find yourself far from God, there's good news. Jesus came to bring you close to God. And you don't you can be here in this service or you can be wherever you are and God's grace can touch your heart and save you. Because worship is a heart issue just like salvation is a heart issue. The Apostle Paul would write this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Here's what he said. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Then he goes on to say, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And if we were to go further down, there would be a statement that said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
If you'll believe in your heart upon the crucified and resurrected Jesus, He'll save you this morning. We'd love the opportunity to spend some time with you to help you to to captivate that in your own life, to, to solidify that decision. And so as the service ends, if we can be a help to you, if if me or any of our pastors or any of our deacons or teachers, we would love to be able to help you this morning to draw closer to God. And if you'll simply let us know your need, we'll take whatever time is necessary to help you to know him. And if you're listening online here, that if you will take that advice of what Paul said and you'll believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and call upon him confessing your sin turning and repenting, Jesus will save you. Let me pray for you this morning as we end. Heavenly Father, thank you for the clarity of your word as you give us instruction on how we should live and how we should behave. And help us, Lord, that in our pursuit of you that we not um, place above you anything. Thank you for the things that we have, the tools that we have to help us to worship. And, and, and may we just be thankful that we can incorporate some of those again in our time. But Lord, help us to understand that what's really important, what matters more than, than any of those other elements, is our heart that seeks after you. Because you said in the word, and you promised, Lord, that if we seek you, we will find you. And may everyone find you today that seeks. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pastor Nate.